welcome. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening for this panel conversation. Um, my name is Maria Pio and I am co-director at the Godwin Turnbeck Museum at Queens College, where I oversee administration and education programs such as this one. My co-director, Louise Weinberg, who curated the current exhibition, Migrations, a study of arts and identity, is a little under the weather today. Um, so unfortunately, she, uh, although she is on the program, she will not be um, joining us. Uh, please note that the exhibition is currently open to members of the Queens College community only, but you are still able to check out this exhibition virtually via our website at www.gtmuseum.org. And there you will also find information about upcoming programs and events. I want to take a moment to thank our donors and funders, including the Friends of the Godwin Turnbeck Museum, the Avery Arts Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Museum Association of New York, Kofferberg Center for the Arts, and Queens College. Without their support, we would not be able to bring this programming to you all today. Lastly, given that we're all together in this virtual space, I just want to go over a few reminders for our virtual program. Please remember to mute when you're not speaking. This reduces any of the background noise that we may have. You can use the chat function to submit any questions and comments throughout the presentation, and that is highly encouraged. Please remain courteous and respectful. And of course, hateful language of any kind will not be tolerated. Tonight, I am very excited to welcome Queens College economics professor, Julian Esteban Patel, whose photographs of the Migrations Concert form the basis for this current exhibition, alongside two former dance students and alumni of Queens College, Elise Walters and Stephen Jelch. Before we begin, I do wanna take a brief moment to formally introduce our panelists. Julian Esteban Patel is an Associate Professor in Economics at Queens College and a New York City-based photographer with a PhD in, art in Economics from NYU. Julian has lived in Tokyo, where he, he was a professor at the University of Tokyo, while at the same time, he photographed some of the biggest artists in rock, pop, metal, and punk music. While Julian is best known for his documentary and live music photography, he also often shoots dance portraits and city landscapes. Elise Walters is a singer, dancer, choreographer, and music teacher. She graduated in 2018 from Queens College with her degree in opera vocal performance. She has recently relocated to Los Angeles and will make her musical and theater debut on the West Coast in Turkey's the Musical this November. And last but not least, since migrations and completing a major in dance at Queens College in 2020, Stephen Jels has taught various dance classes and has been working with the Putnam County Dance Project and will complete an incubation project with Professor Edissa Weeks in late 2022. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists this evening. I wanna start off with um, asking a question of Julian. So uh, I met Julian in the fall of 2018 when he actually uh, came to the museum and approached me with this idea that he had um, for an exhibition from using his photographs from a dance concert uh, titled Migrations that had happened in Queens College um, earlier, uh, a, year, a year before that. Um, so uh, Julian, can you give us a little introduction into your work um, and, and maybe lead us into sort of what was the idea behind it? Sure, thank you, Maria. Uh, first of all, let me um, thank both Maria and Luis, the directors of the museum for making this exhibit happen, also all the sponsors, and of course, Stephen and Elise for being here and agreeing to be in this panel, discussing with me, you know, probably all the pains that I went through when I was shooting photos of them, not only migrations, but throughout the years, because I actually shot them a few times. Uh, so as Maria said, I'm a professor in economics, but I have a passion for photography and I've been doing it uh, for quite a while, starting when I was in high school. Uh, so I want to share, in order for, I think, for me to explain well why migrations, the, the photos that I took, came to be and the exhibition came to be, I think it's easier to understand how I grew as a photographer and how I evolved and where we ended up. So I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to show you some photos and hopefully this will help uh, with that. Okay, so as Maria said, I actually mostly like, sorry, the screen is right now black, but it will turn non-black in a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm just giving a little bit of suspense in here. Um, so as Maria said, I, I basically like mostly documentary photography. And my 
favorite photographer is a photographer called Sebastián Salgado, which is a Brazilian photographer who actually also happens to be an economist. So I always thought it was very inspiring to him. And what he did is he traveled around the world shooting photos of people and what they did in their native environments. And basically, I for a long time, I tried to emulate him. You know, I went to many places in the world. I went to, when I was doing my PhD, I went to Cuba, I went to Vietnam, that you can see this photo here. I went to Turkey, to Taiwan, many places. You know, I also, you know, try to shoot photos of um, non-people, but they always didn't feel to me quite right. I ended up always shooting photos of people. So my photography is basically documenting people and what they do, and mostly trying to document what is going on without interfering in as much as I possibly can. Okay, so uh, again, when I was doing my PhD, I did a um, I, I took a course in photojournalism and I basically followed a, a boxer for about two months, you know, when he was practicing, when he was um, fighting. And then that led me to understand a lot about what it takes to tell a story through photographs. So I kept traveling, I kept shooting photos of people, you know, this one is shot in Vietnam, this one is shot in a Buddhist temple in Singapore. I love markets. I ended up in a lot of places going to markets and shooting what I see. In this particular case, uh, it was a bazaar in Dhaka. In the middle of the day, there were, people were sleeping, and that's what caught my attention. But in the same trip, you know, there was Holi, the, the Festival of Light of Indian, and then people were going crazy. So I shot that. You know, in the process of shooting that, I always met very, very interesting people, and then started shooting portraits of them. So you know, some people were shy. Others were not so shy, you know. So this was shot in Delhi. Again, this was shot in Dhaka uh, in the Festival of Light. So I, I found that what really interested me was, again, showing photos of what people are doing and how they're doing things. I'm fascinated of how things are created. And I think that comes because my father is an architect, so he builds things. So how things are built and the behind these things is to me very important. So. When I finished my PhD, I went to Japan and I lived there for 10 years and I found it difficult to shoot photos of people in a natural way because people, for the most part, they will just pose for you. So I ended up uh, shooting photos in markets and, you know, for instance, I went to where sumo wrestlers um, train and I would shoot photos of that. But if you were to shoot photos in the street, people would always pose for you. So I kind of converged, I ended up shooting uh, things that people didn't care if I was there shooting photos. And because I love music, I ended up shooting photos of musicians. So there was one band that from my hometown in Spain that came to Tokyo and I went and showed photos of them. And then uh, an online publication was interested in those photos and they ended up using them. This was called Smashing Mag. And the good thing about this was that it was associated with a big promoter in Japan. So I was able to go to many, many concerts. I didn't get paid a penny, but I got to see, you know, many Spanish bands, but also big artists like Elvis Costello, Noel Gallagher, Patti Smith, Franz Ferdinand, Gary Clark Jr. I like punk and rock, but I love to see everything. So I ended up shooting all these photos of really great artists in very different styles. And it taught me a lot of what it takes to shoot things that you're not familiar with. Uh, I still converge back to shooting metal. So photos of Fear Factory, this band called Obituary, where my wife saw these photos. is like, why do you shoot photos where you only see the hair of people? I was like, that's the way they are. That's what you got to do. So you got to shoot things the way they are. So anyway, I ended up meeting a lot of Japanese metal bands. And this was one called Cold Rain that um, I got to be friends with them. And what happened with them was that I could take not just photos of them when they were playing, but then when they were rehearsing, when they were practicing, when they were backstage, and they let me hang out with them, so I would go with them and then shoot this other type, like the things that the fans never got to see. And this is what I wanted to show. How are these people doing when they're not on stage? So when they're backstage with them, and you wouldn't know that this guy will have, you know, all these, you know, acupuncture needles, but, you know, that's what I did. So I showed photos of them in rehearsals, and then when I was shooting photos of them rehearsing, I realized that a lot of times these photos were going to look very similar to actual shows. So this is a photo I showed in the rehearsal. This is in the show. It was very, very similar. So this is when I decided that I was actually going to make a difference of whatever was shot on top of a stage that the audience was going to be able to see because people see in color. 
then I will shoot those photos in color. Anything that was not on the stage was going to be shot in black and white. And that's, you know, something that you're going to see uh, in the photos of migrations. So, you know, I saw photos of that. And then I moved back to New York and, you know, I wanted to do something different. And in my first year uh, as a professor here, I met um, Richard Move, which was the director of the uh, concert migrations. And I told him that I, want, I was interested in shooting photos of dance. So he asked me if I, will, if I could shoot photos of his choreography class. So I did that. So I basically shot photos of the students that were choreographing both in the rehearsals and in their show. So I went to every one of the, not every one of the rehearsals, but one rehearsal of every one of the uh, performances. And I showed photos of them, you know? And I thought that this to me was challenging because these people like dancers and Stephen and at least hopefully can talk about that. Uh, they're probably much more reserved than rock stars that, you know, they don't mind that you throw their, my camera in their faces. So I tried to be careful and try to respect their space show them how they were doing, like the interaction between, you know, for instance, in this photo, the one that is in focus was the choreographer. You can see that he's looking at the other dancer trying to figure out how to explain what he had to do. So this is what I wanted to show, you know, just, you know, what it takes to put a performance, you know? So I showed all these black and white photos because they were in rehearsal, you know, showing different aspects, like details that, you know, when you're looking at a, a concert from four, you'll never see. But you know, I could get very close, so that's that's what I did. And then I shot them live, and there is where the photos go back to color because this is what people saw. And this is the first year that I shot the choreography, so I shot several pieces. You know, so everyone had their own style, and I tried to as much as I could capture that. You know, there's you know, I think it was six pieces at the end, maybe uh, six or seven. No, actually, it was eight. Oh, I forgot already so long ago. But anyway. That led me to be able to shoot other things at Queen's College. So I had shot music, now I had shot dance, but then I was also able to shoot uh, other performances they had at Queen's College, for instance, uh, drama. So I shot, you know, theater, which I had never shot before. And I always thought it was super interesting. So I, you know, I shot several theater pieces uh, that they had. I shot a musical. They had a musical every other year they used to have. This is what Damn Yankees. And then I all even got to shoot an opera, which to me, was amazing. Uh, I had never, I mean, I had been to the opera, but you know, shooting an opera to me is so different than shooting rock stars. I had to figure out how to do it to me was intense. But still, I keep shooting photos of dance, you know, and then, you know, I showed this piece uh, that uh, one of the professors had choreographed and then you can see Steven there. And that photograph actually ended up being the poster of the migrations um, uh, exhibit that, you know, Richard, eventually chose. So at the beginning of 2017, Richard approached me saying, look, I have, I'm the director of this program. I want to, I know you can shoot these things. I want to document the whole thing. I want people to understand what it takes to put the, a performance. So let's work together and let's do it. So, you know, we agreed that it will have different parts, uh, this, this project. The only one that I couldn't have and shoot was the auditions. I wanted to do that, but unfortunately I was away from New York at the time for work. So we decided that we'll have four parts. We'll have the rehearsals, people, you know, how, you know, people work to be able to do that. Then we will have this backstage, how they get ready, you know, on the day, the jitter, the concentration that, you know, the dancers have to go through, the actual performance, and also a little introduction of every one of the dancers. So we'll have portraits of those. And this is what the migrations exhibit in the parts of the photographs is. So. I went to the rehearsals, you know, and I shot them. You know, you can see here in the background, you can see Richard kind of looking very intensely at the dancers. You can see Steven there. And the rehearsals also helped me because it will later, you'll see photos where you can actually see similar things. So I learned what was going to happen uh, through the rehearsals. So I went to the different pieces, you know, I tried to be respectful, but at the same time, you know, uh, get close. This one was very close to Stephen, but Stephen by that point had seen me shoot like, you know, three or four of his performances. So I think he was just it's like, whatever you want, just do your thing. <laughs> but other people were a little bit shyer. So I'll try to stay away, you know, try to capture like these moments, like that concentration. In this case, we were listening to Wang Lei talk about what they were wanting to do. You know, you can see here Adisa teaching them the kind of steps that she wanted to do. One thing that I loved about Adisa's piece was that 
she was very communicative with all the dancers. So, you know, they had these round things where they were talking to each other and they were, you know, deciding what they were going to do. And again, you see the piece, you'll never know that this happened. And I, to me, this was important to show. So, you know, this is a piece of uh, Caroline. And, you know, I think one of the important things I find was that while it was very hard for these dancers to rehearse, they also had a lot of fun. And this was important to me, like to show that while it's hard, they still have fun and they, you know, they get to enjoy it and they get to do, you know, silly things at times. Sometimes I show those, sometimes I don't, but, you know. So this showed, you know, the months of preparation that it took. Then right before the performance, they had to get ready for that performance. You know, what happens backstage? Nobody gets to see that. In fact, up until this performance, I was never allowed backstage because, you know, I was a, I'm a professor here at Queen's College, there are students. There's boundaries that you know we thought maybe couldn't be crossed, so we always had an issue. But you know, this time I was allowed, so went backstage and you know try to shoot that, you know, try to be respectful, but but shoot it, you know, how they you know put on their makeup, you know what they go through when uh, they um, they're getting dressed and they're getting fitted. To me, the most interesting part is, you know, the process that a dancer goes through before he goes on stage. And this is a photo that I really like. You can see the dancer is just facing a wall. It's just totally focused on what they're doing. And you can see all the other crap they have backstage that you never see. But also, you know, you show the last minute, you know, things that the, the choreographers, like you don't know, but the, the, the shoe that you see on the left, that's one glass shoe. You know, you can see Steven there and he's getting instructions or so last minute things, you know? But also how distended people are. I love this photo of Elise, he was just laughing. She probably didn't even know that I was there. But, you know, it shows that the camaraderie that the, the these dancers have, they spend so much time together and they know each other so well and they know how to crack each other. And I think it's very important. So, you know, I show that. I also like to show like little details that maybe escape the eye when you're um, seeing the thing. Like this is a little photograph that people in the thesis piece had on their thing that they later on put on the, on the house that they had. And then of course, you know, I showed the performance. Uh, so this was the first piece by Richard Move. And you can see this photo kind of mimics one of the photos I showed in the rehearsal, which again, I used the rehearsals to, see what they're doing, but also teach me, you know, what things are going to happen, because especially in dance, things go very fast. And if you're not ready, you're going to miss it. So it's important for me to, to at least get that upper hand, you know? So I shot, this is Richard's piece and one glaze piece that, you know, Stephen did a beautiful solo uh, at the beginning. One glaze piece had really beautiful light that, you know, it came from different places. And I try to capture, and a lot of these times I will go back just because I needed to see this whole light, you know, uh, it is this piece, you know, had all these, you know, bags and all these things that were moving. Uh, at some point, you know, you had Elise actually doing double duty. She was dancing and she was singing. So <laughs> that was actually very nice. It was surprising to me because I hadn't seen that part of the piece until I saw it in the, in the, in there. And then Caroline's piece that uh, closed the, uh, the concert, you know, it was African based and, you know, had all these, really nice, you know, themes to it. And I thought it was very beautiful. And as I said, I also wanted to, to, to kind of emphasize the people that were doing it and, you know, kind of shoot them and show portraits. I'm just going to show the ones of the two people that we have here, Lise and Steven. I shot several portraits of them. I'm going to spare the dancers and we, I didn't show the embarrassing ones. So I'm just going to show the nice ones. So we have here, Lise, and then I shot one where they were serious and one where they were smiling, and then Stephen, and then Stephen is smiling. So that was the whole thing. We wanted to show everything and give credit to the dancers and the choreographers. So if you go to the exhibit either online or in person, you can see actually those photos that I show for the most part, they're not in the exhibit. I wanted to show some photos that were different, uh, but you'll see other photos. And then you'll see you know the same idea, but in other photos. And this is how the, the thing came about. Then we extended a little bit and from, just the photos of the dance, we extended into a sociological aspect and we included people from the economics department looking at the economics imp impact of immigration. So from the sociology department talking about demographics and we have another photographer there that has beautiful photos. So I encourage everybody to go and see the whole thing, not just my photos, but, but everything there.
so that's how it came about. So now you know a little bit of, of that. So let me stop sharing and then we can go back. Thank you, Julen. That was certainly so many beautiful um, photos. So yes, we do encourage you to, to you know, after the, the program ends to go on our website um, and, and check out these, uh, the photographs. Um, I do wanna um, sort of turn to Elise and Steven. Um, how did it feel to have Julen documenting the process of, of this performance, you know, from going, thinking about from rehearsals to, you know, dress rehearsals to the performance? Um, how did it feel for you guys to have him there? Um, you know, it, at first, I, I will admit, I didn't know what was going on. I was like, oh, a photographer here. That's great. Um, but then since, Julen and I, I started at Queens in 2014 and Julen started in 2014. So I think by the end of four years, I was just so used to him being there um, to the point where some photos that he shared with me, I didn't even remember being in those photos. Um, and it's so beautiful to be able to look at a moment that you, I truly just had forgotten completely um, and to be brought right back to that moment and and remember just everything like it was yesterday um so oh, thank you steven uh i definitely did not think that those moments still like were on hand for a lot of those pictures it's it's just so interesting seeing for us at that moment, everything was a blur, you know, everything like between life, between classes, between remembering what we were doing, between helping other people, between the, just on my own, I would not have remembered any of that, honestly, but those pictures like, hmm, I, I just can't get out of my head, honestly, I'm already thrown back there. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's so incredible how things can just bring you back. Right. I'm sure you seeing these pictures, which by the way, I think um, you both have seen a, a few of these pictures that Julen showed uh, just now for the first time. Right. So I'm sure I just brought you back to that place, uh, back to campus. Um, I guess a follow-up question now seeing these photos, right. So we're, we're looking at these now. Uh, how does it help you teach something maybe about the technique or what could it be improved? Or is it, you know, for you, is it, is it mostly just a good memory of it? Do you think after viewing these that you sort of like see things that you didn't, you don't realize that you're doing when you're dancing? I definitely think that knowing Julen helps a lot, knowing the type of photographer he is and the type of place he's coming from. Um, helps us kind of enjoy it a little more as opposed to needing to break it down. We often will record our rehearsals and look at the technicalities through that, that there's just already so much um, of rehashing the choreography, rehashing the technique that we do over that period of time that um, I think these pictures are shot with a different intention and they offer a different experience honestly just looking at them now um i can't even remember what any of the technique that we were talking about at that point in time like whatever it was it was but i it's just been so long that so that is the, that is the first thing that hits me you know so i think it's very interesting for me to hear steven say that and it kind of it's a relief to me that they don't look at my photos trying to learn anything about their dance with it because they were not shot with that intention. They're not really meant for the dancers to see mistakes that they, they're doing. And the reason is that I'm just, I'm looking for something else. I'm trying to document like a bigger picture. And also, if I actually see that there is a mistake, for instance, if there's four people jumping and one of them is on the ground, I'm not really showing that photo because I don't think, unless I'm trying to make the, a point, and there is something about that image that I think is striking. I don't normally show it. So my idea when I shoot these photos is precisely what Stephen said, like just, just collect that memory, shoot beautiful photos that, you know, will later on be used to, as documents to remember what it was, but not necessarily to learn anything. Because um, first, again, I won't show normally photos that have mistakes of people because I don't think that, you know, it, it's not in the benefit of anybody. 
uh, but also they were never shot with that intention. So is that, to me, at least it's a relief that they're not used that way. Right, that's, that's excellent. Elise, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say to kind of piggyback off of Stephen that there's so much more joy um, cause I think when you're, when you're in school, specifically in the arts, you can just get so overwhelmed with classes and life and you're working and you're, you're trying to be creative and it, everything just gets overwhelming. I mean, that picture of me laughing in the dressing room, I did not remember that at all. Um, I remember being so stressed out about that Edison's piece because it, I think it was like 20 something minutes long. I had to sing in Spanish <laughs> after doing like half of the dance. And I remember like I had nothing but anxiety before going on stage and to like see that moment pre-show where I'm actually like kind of laughing through the nerves. I'm like, oh, this is why I love this. You know, there's still joy <laughs> in the preparation part of it. Just oh. what, one second, sorry. <laughs> I just wanna, because Elise has, talk about how nervous she was. I, I showed this photo before of another dancer facing a wall. Let me show one of Elise kind of in a similar mood. So this is Elise, you know, the same room that she was laughing before, like minutes before, or after, I'm not really sure to be honest. Uh, probably, probably before. She was like really laser focused. Like you can tell that, you know, she's not looking at anybody. She's just like trying to remember her things. And I think that, um that's 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 the thing like and just to to add uh to what i was saying before about me not being shooting things for them to learn like i have no clue about dance like i don't know anything about dance so for me to be able to shoot that would be then that way will be very difficult so i basically just shoot dancers the same way i used to shoot rock stars which is you know let me try to shoot them well to look good to shoot a beautiful photo, because if I try to make it a lesson, I will never be able to do it. And I think in a way, that's maybe an asset to have a photographer that doesn't understand anything about uh, um, dance, because I don't know what dance photos are supposed to be. And I don't know how to shoot them. I just shoot what I want. And I went into music exactly the same way. I didn't know how a music photographer should be. I didn't know that you had to have respect for musicians and not put their camera, my camera in their faces. I just did what I wanted. And it turns out that works very well with metal bands and they loved it. So, you know, it's being an outsider sometimes is an asset in that you should focus in a very different perspective. It may not serve certain purposes of the people who are in the photos, like for instance, learning about whether you make a mistake or not. But, you know, it's, it's something that I think uh, adds, you know, if everybody shoots photos the same way, then they will all be very boring, I would imagine. Yeah, Julian, along those lines, what are some con considerations that you do take as a photographer when taking these photos um, in, in sort of the different stages of the process? So, you know, can you walk us like how much planning is done on your end? What do you think about before approaching, you know, let's say um, the backstage or rehearsal um, for this specific performance versus a rock concert? So um, let me start by the rock concert, which is where I've showed the most. So the same way I tried to go rehearsals in, in the dance to learn about what was going to happen uh, with music. If I know I'm, I need to shoot a, a certain musician, what I will do is I will listen to a lot of music from that musician to get their music and their style and kind of what they transmit so that I can later on shoot that uh, in, or like capture that with my photos. With dancers, to me at the beginning, at least it was very, uh, challenging to kind of respect their space. Again, I was used to going backstage with rock musicians that knew me. I was friends with them. They didn't care what I was doing. They could just do whatever. And all of a sudden, I was trusted in a in a very different environment where people were much younger than me. There were students, and I was a professor. And you know, there were dancers, which are they're much more sensitive people than <laughs> the metal musicians. So. I, I, the way I approach shooting is always, if you're documenting something, you don't want to alter where you shoot it. So I feel like a lot of, like Stephen and Lisa have seen me for a long time. Eventually, probably that we talk to each other, but in 95% of the rehearsals that I ever shot, I never exchanged a word with any of the dancers. I will go in, I will say hello, 
I will just shoot my photos and then say goodbye. Because I felt that if I talked to them, it was going to change the dynamic of what they were doing. And I did not want to do that. Supposedly, you, as a documentary photographer, you're supposed to be a fly in the wall. Now, I'm like six to 200 pounds. So I cannot be a fly in the wall, but I try to, as much as possible, not affect what I'm seeing. So that to me was the biggest challenge. How did I go into these rehearsals? and try to not alter it with my presence there. And I think they did a very good job in general at ignoring me. So I'm pretty sure they knew I was there, but they were good at ignoring me. But that to me was the biggest challenge. Uh, a rock musician, you can you know do a lot of shit to them, sorry. <laughs> and they'll be okay. Uh, dancers, I have to be more careful. So normally what I will do is I will start from shooting farther away and then kind of, see their body language, see if they were comfortable, and then get closer. If you get closer and you see that their body language is going back, then I knew I had to back up. That person was not comfortable with me getting too close, so I will back up. But I showed a photo before of Steven, like kind of doing these things with the hands, that that thing photo was shot like literally inches away from his hand. By that moment, he already was so used to me being there that he was acting like a rock star. You do your thing, I'll do my thing, and the photo will look great, which I thought was great. So the dynamic kind of changed over time, but that to me was the biggest challenge that, you know, it, they're different people. So you had to approach them with a different manner because, you know, their sensitivities are different. So it's not like you can shoot, again, dancers the same way you shoot metal uh, musicians. So that was, was the thing. Wow. And I'm dying to know, did you have to get permissions from the sumo wrestlers to shoot them before you, you went in there? <laughs> I love that oh, picture. <laughs> so I don't, I, that, that's a funny picture actually. Let me, if I can bring it up again. I thought uh, it was wonderful. Because what happened was that I did not have to ask permission to shoot photos of them, but Japan is very protective of uh, the image of anybody. So basically while I didn't have to ask permission to shoot it, if I ever wanted to use it for publication for anything, I will actually have to contact them. And the reason is the following, let me, go back and share the my screen because this is um so the person here standing on the back of the other person that's a grand sumo wrestler this guy has won more titles than anybody else now this is wow. this is a i don't i would imagine it's like three four hundred pounds that guy standing on the back of somebody else so that doesn't look very good there's a lot of you know talk about bullying and sumo wrestling and whatever so i will not be able to use that photo if I want, and I show it here, that's fine. But if I wanted to publish it, I will definitely get need to get permission, and I will not get permission for that. Um, so you know, in terms of, in general, my philosophy when shooting photos is I rather ask forgiveness than permission, because when you ask permission, a lot of times people say no, but they don't really know why. So I never hide. My photos are always shot in clear sight. Like people know that I'm shooting the photo when I go around. If they have a problem with it and they say no, then I don't shoot the photo, I respect their will. But if you ask permission, a lot of times they're gonna say no. Now, shooting photos in a rehearsal is totally different. You need permission of the people, you're going in a private space. But when I'm shooting in the street, I'll just shoot it. What I do with it at the end is different, but you know, I, I don't normally ask permission. If they tell me I need permission, then I get permission. But if they don't tell me, I'll just go in. And I've gone into people's houses, them knowing that I was going in, and shoot photos and then leave. They smile at me, I shoot my photos and then I go. That's okay. People are very friendly in a lot of countries. You know, in Cuba, they were great. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's really, really interesting. And I guess, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, you have that uh, sort of that capability, but, um, you know, I'm sure, I don't know, do, do you feel like, you know, like a little, Maybe that that helps you shoot the photographs, sort of knowing that maybe you know you didn't necessarily ask permission, but um, you're there anyway. <laughs> Does that help? I mean, there's a little bit when I'm traveling. There's always a little bit of a thrill going somewhere that maybe you know you're not supposed to be, but they know you're there and they let you be. It's like, sure, I'll see. I'll see how far I can go. <laughs> uh, I I use that exact philosophy when I'm shooting photos of, of musicians or even dancers, like what I was saying about, I start far and then I get closer. I'll go, let's see, I, I have an image in mind that I want to shoot. And if it requires for me to be very close, I want to ask the dancer, can I get this close? What I will do is I'll start far, start shooting, getting closer. 
And again, observe the dancer and see if that dancer is getting uncomfortable. Is that, is that, then I back away, mm -hmm. that's it. If not, I keep going. So is, is this thing like, how far can I take it without invading anybody's privacy, but to get the image that I want? And at times, getting an image in your head is kind of a curse because you can never get it. So you try to look for it and go and go and it, it never comes, but you go for it. And then um, obviously when you're in a, the private space of a, like a rehearsal, I don't try to push boundaries very far just because I don't think it's respectful to them. Mm -hmm. I'm actually mm -hmm. much more, I do that much more when I'm shooting music, especially when I'm shooting musicians that I know even if they don't give me permission to do certain things, I don't care, I'll do it. And they got to throw me off the stage if they want to. But I will actually just, you know, go on the stage, go between the drums of people, you know, get in the faces of people. And at some point I figured the manager is gonna just knock on my back. It's like, you and get the fuck out of the stage. <laughs> this is too much. But, and then you'll get kicked out. <laughs> yeah, but I got never, some great photos to show, so. <laughs> I've, never, I've never been kicked out. And I always find that it's more like, I, my my thinking is if the manager knew what I have in mind, he will t let me lose and like do whatever you want. Just make sure that you're not in between the audience and the musician right. so that the audience can see. But, you know, be free. Because when I'm free, that's when my imagination goes wild and then the best photos come out. Wonderful. And <laughs> in a way, I was given the freedom when I was shooting the migrations to go into all these rehearsals and nobody told me ever, no, you cannot do this. So that was great because then I could let that within the boundaries that I needed to respect, I was able to do what I thought had to be done to show these things. So I thought that was great. Okay. But what I would like to know is, uh, I have no shame in getting, again, my camera into people's faces, but as dancers, Stephen, at least, do you feel at times that I was crossing a boundary? They were like, yeah, I'm not comfortable with this. And maybe I didn't realize, I thought I was realizing everything, but maybe I didn't. Was there ever a That's problem, true. a moment? where you know you were like you and you need to back off i'm not going to tell you but please back off uh only one moment comes to mind i think it was one of the first um student shows that i was doing and i was jumping in the air and i was being caught and i was reaching my hand out and you had wanted to take a picture of that moment and the only i wasn't uncomfortable with it necessarily but i was jumping towards you with such force that I felt like I had to hold myself back otherwise I'd hit you or your camera and I did not want to nope mm -mm. my first dance show I don't think so I was not about to run into problems like that so that's the only reason that's the only time I really felt that I had to hold back other than that it's just it you've just been around the department for so long that it was everything else has been pretty much second nature yeah to me it's a pity that you know had you told me that, that would have been very good information. But because I had this idea of like, let's not communicate with them so we don't break the 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 like this wall that they do their thing and I do my thing. Maybe that's why you felt, Stephen, that you didn't want to tell me. And I didn't actually probably see that, which was a pity. Like I did not want to make you uncomfortable. And if I did, you know, it happens. I just hope that, you know, we could have communication that, you know, would have transmitted that to me. But I think. You, you still were okay later on shooting, let me show you. So I think we, I didn't do too bad and you were not too uncomfortable, I hope. Yeah, it was less about comfort and it was more, even, even in the moment, I felt we were like, kind of like sizing each other up being like, how far are you going? How far am I going? Where, where can we be in the middle where that doesn't clash? But I think that's actually what helped lead to our uh, subsequent relationship down the line artistically. Elise, do you have anything to say? I I remember my first student choreography showcase that I was in. So we would have um, student showings, like just kind of like checkpoints along the semester before the final performance. And those were very stressful because, you know, you were just working with a student choreographer one-on-one -on -one, and then you basically had the entire dance department like on a Wednesday afternoon come together and see how far along the dance was. And some things you had just thrown together like the night before. And I remember the first time I was very nervous in front of Julian because I was like, none of us actually know this piece at all. I mean, this was like halfway through the semester. And I was just so nervous that he was going to capture a moment where all of us were doing different things. I'm sure it would have looked fine. But I just I remember thinking to myself, stay in the moment, keep keep just dancing, just kind of you kind of have to blur him out. 
and as, as well as everybody else and just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's good. I think that um, I understand uh, the pressure of, you know, performing when you know they're photographing you. And the pity is that um, unlike musicians that I've shot many, many, many times, I've showed you guys enough times that by the end, you guys knew that I was going to shoot good photos so you could relax. That I was not going to show anything bad or anything. But had, you know, you guys gone into that, you know, knowing that first, I will never show anything that will make you guys look bad, at least pur purposely. I mean, I could maybe show a photo that I think is a beautiful photo that maybe shows a mistake and I'm not realizing that it's showing a mistake, but pur purposely I will never uh, do that. But, you know, normally what I, one thing, for instance, that I did because it's so important to get the confidence of the people you're shooting. When I was shooting in Japan for some musicians, if I shot them repeatedly, what I will do is I will actually print the photos from the previous concert and give them as gifts to the musicians. So they will say, oh, these photos are super cool. They'll have them and I was like, okay, you're, like you're cool. You shoot good photos, go for it. Um, but in, in terms of that, for instance, let me, I think that when you're performing, probably it is stressful, but I have a photo of you actually choreographing. Uh, that I shot when you were choreographing. And I only realized, it's funny because I only realized these things. Are you seeing the, the photo? So I didn't only realize this was your piece when I saw you outside of the, the, the tape, you know? And I was like, wait, this, this has to be Elise's piece because she's, she's the one there. And then behind you can not really see, but there is, um, Steven was one of the dancers there. So this was one of the things that she was talking about. Like one of these Wednesdays where everybody went and they had to show it and it was halfway through and then they're doing it. And on top of that, they have this huge, you know, Spanish guy very, very close to them. So I can totally sympathize with you on how nerve wracking must be for me to be there. I think I, I try to kind of thread the needle of like, I need to be there, so I need to do my job, but I need to understand that this is also difficult for them. So I'll try to be as close as I can without making them too uncomfortable. A little bit uncomfortable, I'm okay with. Too uncomfortable, then no, then, then I'm doing something wrong. I have a question. Um, we have a question from our from the chat. Um, did the dancers see these photos when they were students or um, or later? Maybe after they graduated. When 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 do you guys get to see these photos? Um, I. So after each semester, uh, we were allowed to view um, a folder that was given to us either from our choreographer or um, from the professor. Um, and then it was kind of up to us to save the photos, which I did not do a good job of. Um, Steven, I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's been really wonderful to reconnect. And you know, some of these pictures that we are seeing um, are the first time we're seeing them today. Uh, that that photo that Julian just showed, um, I don't remember him being there at all for that moment. Oh. I just remember being so like uh, that. That was my piece that I choreographed, and I remember being just so invested in the storyline of that that like it didn't matter what was happening. I was just so zoomed in on my three dancers, which Stephen was one of them. So especially that exact moment, like that lift, <laughs> that lift. Yeah. Is how, like we were working <laughs> on that lift for so long. Uh, and just like the capturing of Raven coming down yeah, into my that arms. moment. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Along those lines, I know um, we've talked about um, Elise and Steven in uh, the importance about documenting one's work, right? And the, the importance of archiving your work. Um, for anyone, you know, maybe the, the starting out in their careers, um, how important do you think this is? Uh, very important. Um, I think technology and just media is like, it's just moving so fast. And it was moving fast at a time where I was just so focused on school and my studies and trying to become the best artist that I could that I, I personally will admit I did not do a good job at all of saving videos of me singing, of saving videos of me dancing. Although I do have a lot of videos of rehearsals. <laughs> um, but it's been it's been a joy to kind of go back down this path and look at these and and kind of obtain lost photos that 
have brought me back to moments and have kind of reignited a fire and a desire to continue being an artist. Um, they're going to look really good on the website too <laughs> that I'm creating. <laughs> Um, I do know that when I started at Queens College, Nia Love, one of the professors in the dance department, um, emphasized strongly that it's important to self-archive any work that you do, any small, like, little thing you learn in this class, just, just throw a recording to, or just do any little thing that you can, store it away, tuck it away for when you can come back to it later. And ever since like, especially with Julen, starting with these uh, photos in the dance department in 2014, 2015, at least with me, um, just having like a, also like a professional set of photos that I could have helped ignite the fact that, okay, in my own life, I should also probably be doing the work aspect of it, of the, or the production of anything that I do, even, I have videos on videos of just like small routines that I've come up with that way, even down the line, I can just like pull out of my hat. And it has honestly uh, helped me apply to certain things and get scholarships. Uh, I've just gotten a lot of benefits from just making sure that there's at least a video. Well, let me catch a recording of this like 30 second thing, this one minute thing, this maybe even two minutes of just me messing around, of me going through someone else's choreography, just so I can see my body doing these things. Because eventually, the, once you're doing so much, some of some things just have to go. Like you can't hold on to everything at the same time, especially when you're in all these intense techniques with all these incredible people teaching all these incredibly different things, that it's, it's good to have those types of files on hand for as an artist to go back to and even just refresh your memory or uh, expand on even. Yes, so document, yeah. document, document your work. Yes, sorry, let me, let me add one thing to this because this is one of the reasons why Richard and I started doing the, the thing, uh, I think it was in 2015 is the first time that I did the choreography. So what we did was we showed the rehearsals, but he also wanted me to shoot like portraits of the dancers. He also wanted me to shoot um, like the, the promo shot. And he emphasized, look, you have the chance to have a photographer in these things. So you, he was telling to all the students, you know, you need to make sure that take advantage of it, you know, save these things, you know, understand the value of them, uh, of all these different aspects. You know, again, you get in these headshots, you can use them later, you know, make sure that, you know, you, you get them right. So I think Richard and the other people in the dance department, the professors, do understand these things. I think that at times students they're too caught up in their lives and they realize this a little bit later, maybe when they need it and know when they actually have it. So this should be for anybody who's looking at these or listening to this and is in the process now of getting uh, these photos taken. Like now is the time to save them because later on I do a very good job at archiving my things. If somebody emails me three years later, I still have those photos, but you know it's kind of a pain to look for them. So it's easier if each other saves their own photos. But I have to say, it's not just dancers. Like I get requests from musicians that I saw like five years ago. It's like, oh, you think, can you send me photos of these concerts? Like what? You didn't save these things, <laughs> you know? But so it happens, people do it all the time. So it's yeah. not just them. Julian, we have a question from Edessa. Um, You've taken dance photograph is an art form and very few people do it well. You have an amazing knack for capturing the emotional intensity of an affirmal moment in dance. There's also a fabulous sense of rhythm in your photographs. Do you play an instrument or how do you tap into the rhythm of the movement? Um, I think that is probably coming from shooting musicians. In terms of playing an instrument, I used to when I was younger, I used to play drums. So I don't know if that the rhythm of that just helps me with capturing that that she's talking about. But I would not consider playing drums like a, a plus I was kind of terrible, <laughs> like <laughs> knowing how to play an instrument. But to me, I think what I brought to uh, the dance photographs, which I think is maybe what um, has captured uh, Edisa's uh, you know, moment is when I was shooting musicians, uh, 
especially when you hear rock musicians or punk or metal, they're so visceral and they're so lively that if you don't are not able to capture that, you're missing 90% of what their music is about. So to me, it was always about their expression, their face, their eyes, you know, what they're trying to tra transmit with their music. So I brought that to the dance in that, you know, dance is also a very expressive thing. And at times it's very calm, but sometimes it's very visceral. So I'm, I, I try to do that. Like, I feel that I try to understand as much as possible what the choreographer is trying to transmit with their piece. And obviously I don't understand 90% of what they're trying to say, but whatever I can capture, I try to put in those photos, but it's always very important, the feeling. To me, a photo with no feeling, it has nothing. And let me just give you an example. There was one time I went, I had to shoot photos in a festival and I had to shoot photos of a guy called Ron Sexsmith, which I hated the music. It was like really boring guy, just with a guitar doing nothing. And I always felt that even though the guy was boring, I could not shoot boring photos of him because that would just be a bad photo. So I had to try to capture him in a way that even though he was boring, it would still be an interesting photo. Obviously dancers are much easier to shoot, but it's always that. If you don't capture emotion in those, in artists, you're not capturing anything. So I go into that, trying to show always that. That's kind of like what I try to do. Right. Now, a lot, we have a question here that says, do you feel like your main goal of your photographs is to show a story and capture the feeling within the moment? Yes. To me, it's always every photograph has to have, even portraits have to have a story. They have to bring you to some moment that you're trying to imagine what's happening. It has to have, a, a, my favorite photos are the ones where you can imagine a whole story around it. Like the photo I shot of Elise looking through the door. You can, you know, kind of think the story behind that. So it's always, it's always that. And this is why I also use a lot of wide angles because then you can show a lot of things in that photograph and it tells much more of the story. I like uh, documentary photography from the storytelling point of view. It's easy to tell a story when you shoot in many photos, but even within every one of the photographs, they should be independently beautiful and tell a story in and of themselves. So I, I do try to do that. That's one of my goals when I'm shooting photos. And one other question here, I'm trying to go through the chat. Uh, what was the reasoning or the thought process for shooting the images um, of the people on of students on stage in color while some of the images off stage um, are in black and white um, or vice versa? What, what led you to, to, to do that? That's a, a good question. And I've been asked that question a few times. And I will bring it back to, uh, uh, I took this course on uh, documentary photography. And in one of the classes, uh, the professor talked about the movie Raging Bull. It's a movie that is all in black and white. But then there is a scenes where, you know, you see Robert De Niro fighting and those are on TV and those images are in color. So he pointed at how the difference in color and black and white tells you the different parts of the story and how separating that, you know, you can either use black and white for all your photos or you can use color, but if you're gonna mix it, there has to be a clear distinction as to why you're mixing. And that's something that I take to heart. Like I will not, like some photographers do it and I don't have a problem with it, but I don't like, let's say in general, shooting photos of rehearsals, both in color and in black and white. So if it's one thing, it's always in the same tone. If it's the other thing, it's always in the same tone. And my philosophy is, well, obviously audiences see in color. So they're gonna see the color, they're gonna miss part of the, what they saw if they don't see the color in that, in that photograph. So the stage photos, I choose them to be in color. And then because the backstage and the rehearsals, they're something that they don't get to see. I feel like black and white, you're taking something out and it makes it a little bit more a temporal, like black and white photography comes forever. So you, it's kind of hard at times to say when a photo was taken, if it's in black and white, so it gives this mysticism to the photos, like putting it in black and white, especially now with everything is in color, it gives a different tone. So my, my thinking was, okay, so everything that they cannot see, that the audience cannot see is gonna be in black and white and it's gonna give this mysterious look to it because it's in black and white. So that's how I separated it. But it comes from that teacher that I had that talked about the movie Raging Bull and separating it that way. And I just used that. I could have used a different one, but that's how I do it. Um, I see a, another question. Um, 
take care of action then scroll to the top um are there any other fields uh perhaps outside of music and theater that you're looking to photograph or that you would like to to, to photograph in the future um sure i mean basically i've i've shown other things uh that i like documentary photography in general is, is to, to me what really drives me. Uh, and I don't show these photos. I've never actually showed these photos, but I lived in New York on September 11th. I was doing my PhD. I actually heard the planes crashing into the Twin Towers and I grabbed my cameras and went down and showed photos of the whole thing. And I have those photos and I don't show them just because they're not pleasant photos to me. So I don't have a need to, to show those photos, but I have this type of documentary photography. That's kind of like what drives me. So anything that I can document I'm interested. For instance, I've always thought that I would like to shoot the same way I shot the dancers and the rehearsals. I would like to shoot photos of cooks. I love food and I love kitchens. Kitchens are so plastic when it comes to photography and seeing them that I would love to go into a restaurant, like become friends with the chef. Show my photos of dancers, musicians, like, look, I can shoot the same type of thing, but of your restaurant. And then show that, show all the cooks, everything, like how crazy it is in the kitchens and then shoot the restaurant, you know, kind of like do that. So for instance, that is something that I've always wanted to do. So if any chefs in the audience with <laughs> restaurants, I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> Thank you. There's, uh, let me see, there's another question um, from Edessa. Uh, I altered a few, she says, Julian, um, I altered a few of your rehearsal photos to remove blemishes. So for example, removing the ugly black tape that was holding up the fabric that we had to use to cover the mirrors. Um, I felt like it had incurred the wrath of a tornado. What are your thoughts about altering your images? I think it's better to not tell me what you're doing. <laughs> I have a big issue. I take uh, a long time looking at my photos, selecting them, I'm editing them to look the way I think they should look. Again, because I'm trying to tell a story with my image, in my head, uh, that story is told in the way I edit the photo. Um, now, if you re I actually myself remove things, like I will burn or dodge parts of the photos to, to hide things which are ugly or like crop them in a particular way. So in general, I ask uh, to people that I give the photos, to not alter my photos. Like the way I give it to you, that's the way I would like the photo to be shown. Sometimes people will come back to me. It's like, you know, can you actually edit this photo in this particular way so we can get rid of this? And you know, if I think that that's not necessarily a part of the photo that I need, then I, I will do that. But I try to ask people in as much as possible to not, for instance, turn a color photo into black and white or to change the tones in a particular photo. I have a particular style in my black and white and in my colors that I like and is very consistent. And in Japan, for instance, if you talk to, to photographers that they know me, they can recognize which photos are mine because this is a very particular style. And I've taken a long time to get to that. And I like those photos to look that way. I don't want them to look any other way. So in general, I don't like people editing my photos. Uh, I understand why people do it. And, you know, I'm not going to tell it anybody, but <laughs> I rather people ask me rather than doing themselves. And I imagine this, um, this is sort of, you know, it, it may happen um, more often now, given just how many programs there are to quickly even edit things from your own phone, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of uh, photographers um, that have to deal with that also, but at the same time, you know, sometimes if you do, um, you know, if if you do need to alter something slightly, right? Um, I, I think in this, this case, it was just you know the black tape, right? So it's it's sort of a slight um, you know alteration to the photograph. I think you know that also in in on the other side, it just makes it easier for us to be able to to have that capability now more than ever. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely, you know, so many considerations that, you know, we don't think about that are out there now. Um, so absolutely. I have a, uh, so we are actually at time, but there are a few other questions that I do want to try and get to. So if you want to hang around, that is great. Um, you know, just um, maybe another 10 more minutes. Um, I, you know, definitely thank you for your time. Um, Elise, uh, Edison said you had, you had no idea that you were nervous about singing. What helps you work through your nerves? Um, actually, so from a singing performing point of view, um, 
I all I'm a jumper backstage before I go out and sing. Um, yeah, Steven's laughing because I think he's seen this. So I will like bounce. It's the best way to get on top of my air and to like just get the blood moving. Um, so I think because of how much we moved in the first portion of uh Edessa, your piece, I think I was just confident that like once my blood got moving, once I got moving, like I'm gonna I was gonna be ready to sing, my air was gonna be there. Um yeah, I kind of just shoved you shove it all down the nerves and you just hope it comes out to be something on stage that's beautiful. I mean, maybe that all also helps, right? I mean, we were just talking oh, yeah. about this as we were starting this this panel, right? Steven, you want to say yeah, what yeah, happened yeah. to you today? How, do you, how uh-huh. did you work through your nerves for this panel conversation? I mean, I <laughs> nerves in general feels to me like you're about to go into a pool that you haven't entered yet and the pool's like kind of cold. But once you get in, you know that you'll be fine, you know, after you sit in it for a second and just let it wash over you. But in that moment, like before, you're kind of just like, I don't want, like, I just gotta make, all right, I just, all right, we gotta go in, it's okay. We'll just, I just gotta figure it out. I'll just, I'll just go, I'll just go, we'll just go, we'll go. And then you're in, um, and then you're in the cold water and then you're absolutely fine. Uh, so I, I get that notion from like starting a show or definitely like Elise was saying, she was, she revved herself up and just stepped right into it. That's honestly the only thing you can do <laughs> and I wonder, do you both get um, people saying to you that, you know, but you're both performers. Why do you have nerve? Like, why are you nervous? Don't, are you used to this? Do you, do you get that from people? Cause I feel like that may be something that gets asked of, of you guys. Yeah, very much so. There's definitely like this notion that like, because you're on top of it all the time, like nerves just shouldn't be a part of it. But um, there's such like a back culture of making sure that you're hitting everything, uh, especially with like longer performances and especially if you're in multiple works for those. There's just so much to keep track of. And it just it's just a natural anxiety that stands in that along with you while you walk out there. Uh, I think I'm not sure I've heard something that helps me calm down when I think about all these nerves and, you know, dealing with like a possible imposter syndrome, thinking I shouldn't be feeling these nerves. I heard that once, um, as long as you're nervous about it, you at least care about it. And I think that really has helped like push me through things, especially I'm like, at least I'm invested, you know? Absolutely. At least do you feel the same way? Yeah, I don't think you ever you don't ever not have the nerves um you just kind of get used to the feeling that's just the best way to describe it um i mean with a with a year and a half of a pandemic i'm having lots of strange nerves because it's been a very long time of no performing or being in front of people so wow guess you got to learn how how those feelings feel again. <laughs> yeah, that brings a whole different, you know, layer to it. Absolutely. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, okay, I do see another question. Um, Julian, I believe this one's for you. It says, um, is there a single photo taken from the long ago that inspired and created this part of your motivation? Uh, there actually is. My whole thing about shooting documentary, especially for music, came when I was a um, teenager. I saw in a magazine, um, a photo of the Rolling Stones backstage just lounging, you know, sitting and talking. And I thought that's so, it was a black and white image of the Rolling Stones. And I thought that was so cool. Like, you know, you get to see what these guys are doing before they go on stage. And I was like, one day I would love to go on tour with a band and shoot this type of thing or do what I did with migration and show all these backstage things. And it all came really from this photograph that I saw of the Rolling Stones when I was like 13 or 14. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that that photograph, and to be honest, I don't remember exactly the photograph right now. I have an image of it. If I were to see the actual photo, maybe it's different from the one I have in my head, but it was that idea. It's the idea of peeking into a part of, you know, something that you think is super cool that you never get to see and showing this backstage and this way of documenting all this life that audiences never get to see that drove me to, to like documentary photography. And when I'm shooting for us as dancers and musicians, not just shoot the stage, 
but especially should the backstage and the rehearsals and all the other things. Because the stage you see, the other things are, you know, to me, the most interesting one, because that's what people don't get to see. You don't get it, from there. And that's definitely, Julian, something that translates well in your photography that I feel like uh, gives almost artistic license for you to be in the space as it is. There's something interesting about like, I don't know about other areas necessarily, but when you're creating or like just in the, just toiling over what you need for this performance you're trying to put on, uh, Julen can come in very nicely and give an expansion of a perspective of what you are trying to do. When you invite per perhaps colleagues or peers or mentors, they will come in and they not, it's just natural that they have their own opinions on what you're creating in that moment, um, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but there's something to Julen about being an outsider, about really trying to hone that like documentary lifestyle or art style um, in his work that allows him to like pluck and pull out parts of the work without innately trying to uh, alter it or shift it in any way without offering any like a uh, structural perspective on what you're trying to create or the moment or the atmosphere, he will just see the moments that he can try and pull out for you in ways that you've never seen before, which is I think the definite highlight of having Julen around, especially in the dance department. I, I feel very honored to have someone that can look at things like that without um, necessarily being in the same overlapping field but still can, can capture that like universe, uh, almost these universal ideas of sad or happy or intense or calm uh, or processing or in the moment or rushing or completely turned off. Just it, I just think it, everything that from leading from that one picture that you had, I feel translates to everything you've done or at least I've experienced with you very, very well. Yeah, let me just add one thing, which I think is great to hear Stephen say that, because I never thought of that uh, from that perspective. But the fact that I'm a total outsider and I don't understand anything about dance means that I put no judgment of anything that they're doing. To me, what these guys are doing is amazing. Like, I'm so amazed that they can do that. So I just try to capture how great it is. And I have no clue. They could be doing something terribly wrong that maybe a professor could be judging them and they're going to think, oh, maybe this is not the right to me it's like wow wow like i just like that i feel like a kid seeing them if students just do these amazing feats so i just try to do that i just try to capture that moment and translate it into a beautiful photograph that can you know show everybody else how amazing it is that what they're doing and how amazing their life is in that particular moment wow now, I do want to get to, um, I'm cognizant of time, so I want to get to our last question, which I think will, um, I'm going to, I think it was directed for Julian, but I'm going to actually also direct it to both Stephen and Elise so that um, we all, you know, you each can say something um, at the end. So uh, for Julian, do you believe that your personal experiences have shaped the way that you shoot your photographs? Um, and then for Stephen and Elise, do you believe that your personal experiences have shaped the way that you approach your work in um, on stage? So in my case, absolutely. Uh, and I will just say, I started by saying that my favorite photographer was an economist. And I actually got to meet him and I talked to him and he actually told me that being an economist, especially a social scientist, that I studied labor economics, could actually help me with my photos. Because I, you know, I deal with things of unemployment. So I go to places where, you know, I try to capture their lives from that perspective. You know, I, I analyze their data when I'm doing my research, but then I go and get to see them. And that definitely teaches me how to shoot that. At the same time, if you actually know me, I'm a very, very kind of like loud person. So that's why I like that type of the music that I like and the liveliness of dance. That is actually why I love shooting those things. Something that would be super calm, that will not be, you know, kind of me. So my experiences and my work and my personality is what drives me to shoot passionate people such as musicians or dancers or maybe one day cooks. So absolutely, yes.
Stephen and Elise? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think I said this once in one of our like previous meetings. Um, so I was pretty discouraged after my first opera main stage production. Uh, one of the biggest critiques I got from my mentors and professors was that um, I wasn't acting enough, which I mean, when you're singing in opera completely in a foreign language, um, it can be a lot. Um, and Julen's photos from that particular production, I, well, I looked very animated. It looked like I knew what I was singing and talking about and I was acting. Um, so after you like a post mortem, <laughs> if you want, um, after yeah, the yeah, post mortem, yeah. they, they you. said, yeah, Everybody so you can wants. see what, what I'm talking about. I was really discouraged though, um, that I felt like I wasn't connecting to the music. Like, why am I an opera singer? Why am I doing this? But like, look at that. <laughs> like, I'm clear, <laughs> yeah. like I'm, I'm clearly having fun. I'm clearly having fun. Um, and then just seeing the photos of me dancing and just seeing how focused and how into the moment I can get um, has been really lovely to, to just go back to that moment and realize like, oh, this is, this is what brings me joy. This is what makes me want to tell stories and want to do it with my voice and want to do it with my, my body. And yeah, it is just, this whole process has been amazing to go back down memory lane and see all of this. Steven. Honestly, Julen's photos has done wonders for my morale. And prior to being a dancer before I got to college, um, it really wasn't something that I pursued. But once I got to college, I felt like I was playing catch up a lot of the time. And you get lost in that very easily. Um, I felt like I was learning from a lot of people and it was, uh, it was, it was coming along well. I feel like uh, I, my perspective of just being hungry for any technique and any person to like teach me something new and see even like how they, their movement and their ideas of movement looked on me. Um, it, it, it really just kind of skyrocketed me into this uh, collaborative uh, artistic mindset. So having Julen around really started that morale boosting for me as a performer. And one of the, times that it actually came to a head where I was just like my anxiety was like stuck right here is when one of my first works that I choreographed went up on stage I wasn't uh in it because I like to take a step back so I can just see everything as a whole and not need to worry about my own body literally in the space and I had mixed feelings a lot about a lot of it. There was a lot of, it was a difficult and very convoluted piece that I had created. However, getting at the end of it with Julen taking pictures of it, I was, a, all of those anxieties were washed away. I realized like this is, these are, there are little tidbits in each of them, in each photo that he has that just, again, like Elise said, reminded me why I'm here in the first place, why I even care about doing any of it. Just being able to tell stories like that. Let me show you a photo. Let me show a photo of that. <laughs> Go ahead. That is that this is the piece you're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Oof. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Just, there was just so much, there were so many things going on on stage at the time. I was like, this either looks great or it's a total whirlwind. And it ended up looking fantastic. And I certainly felt a lot better about the piece. It, it I, I hope to expand on it still. Uh, it's still like turning in the back of my mind. Um, but yeah, definitely nowadays I come at it with a very informed, I come out my work with a very informed perspective. And I definitely have to say Julian has def been there to help escalate that. Thanks, well. Thank you, everyone. Um, I guess we're going to end it there. Uh, this has been just a wonderful uh, evening. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I especially want to thank Julen, Stephen, and Elise uh, for, the, for, for going uh, through this process as of planning. Uh, but we all know that this was such a great conversation and such an important conversation to have, too, um, because I know people will, will definitely be 
be looking at this YouTube recording um, soon. Um, but again, thank you, everyone. Um, I do encourage you to go to our website, www.gtmuseum.org, and take a look at the wonderful um, photographs from the exhibition. Um, and again, we will, once we have this recording ready, um, be sure to send this out to all of you so that you could see it uh, and refer to it and maybe share it with um, anyone that may be interested. But again, I just want to give a huge round of applause to Jewel and Steve and Elise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, to all of you for being here with us this evening um, in this virtual space. Um, so yes, thank you all. Be well. Um, and it was great seeing you. Thank you, everyone.